In the familiar yet unfamiliar world around us, there are myriads of insects. Crickets, butterflies and bees, bugs and beetles, flies and fleas. Whether we like it or not, they benefit or interfere with our lives in many ways. What exactly is an insect, and how do we distinguish one from another? Basically, an insect's body consists of three parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. The middle section, the thorax, carries three pairs of legs, and usually two pairs of wings. The presence of six legs is the distinguishing feature of every insect. So we know immediately that the notorious black widow spider is not an insect because it has eight legs, not six. Two sections to its body, not three. And yet there seems to be some sort of similarity between the spider and the insect. There's a similarity too between the spider, the insect, and the crayfish that lobster-like creature which scuttles amongst the rocks in pond and stream, yet it is no insect either by our definition. However, crayfish, spiders, and insects are in fact classified together in a large group of the animal kingdom called the arthropods because of an underlying similarity. In any vertebrate animal, such as a bird or a bear, a fish or a frog, the limbs and body are stiffened and supported by a jointed framework of bones, an internal skeleton. But in the arthropods, the skeleton is outside the body and takes the form of a horny tube enclosing each segment of the body and limbs. Between segments, this covering is thin and pliable, allowing the joints to move. The praying mantis, then, with its external skeleton and jointed limbs, is an arthropod. But as its body is made up of three sections and it has six legs, it is also an insect. The mayfly, too, is an insect. So is the beetle. And the dragonfly, although differing greatly in appearance from the beetle, is also an insect. There is no end to the diversity of insect forms, yet they are all built upon the same basic plan. Over 750,000 different kinds we know already, and how many more there may be we can only guess. Insects have been arranged into over 20 groups or orders, which include similar related types. Let's look at a few of these. The grasshoppers and locusts, for example, belong to the order Orthoptera, meaning straight-winged. These insects have long, narrow, leathery forewings and broader, membranous hindwings. They have mouth parts adapted for biting and chewing vegetation. There are many different kinds of grasshoppers. Some, like the long-horned grasshopper, are beautifully camouflaged to merge with their surroundings. Another member of the Orthoptera is the lively cricket whose friendly chirping so annoys the unsympathetic housewife. Our friend, the praying mantis, which belongs to the Orthoptera, also has mouth parts adapted for biting and chewing but the mantis is carnivorous and not vegetarian, like its near relative and victim, the grasshopper. Another important order is the hemiptera, the only insects to which the term bug correctly applies. 
In these true bugs, the mouth parts are highly specialized for piercing and sucking. With its long beak, the cicada extracts sap from the trees as it sings in the hot summer sun. Other hemiptera, like the milkweed bug, can cause widespread damage to vegetation by their sucking activities. In this order, too, we see another way in which insects may be classified, that is, by the manner in which the insect develops. In the milkweed bug, as in nearly every insect, the life cycle started with the egg. The young milkweed bug, which hatches from the egg, looks very like its parents, except that it has no wings. It's called a nymph, and has the buds of wings upon its back. As the nymph grows, it becomes too big for its skin, and sheds or molts several times. The wing buds become larger after each molt, and finally reach their full size with the last molt. covering will dry and harden and change color to give the adult its characteristic appearance. This three-stage life cycle, that is egg, nymph, adult, occurs in several orders of insects. But in others, like the butterflies and moths, development can be quite different and the young will bear no resemblance to the adults. Their life cycle, too, starts with the egg. But from the egg hatches not a nymph resembling its parents, but something quite different, a tiny worm-like larva or caterpillar. second or larval stage of the life cycle, the body gradually grows to its ultimate size. The caterpillar, like the plant bug nymph, will molt several times in the process. In this characteristic second stage, the different Lepidoptera, as this order is named, have an enormous variety of caterpillars. Some congregate in swarms, like the forest tent caterpillars. Many others are solitary, like the red humped caterpillar. Around the world, they exhibit a dazzling pageant of form and color as they feed on most of the trees and plants which are known to man. At the final molt, the caterpillar does not become an adult butterfly, but enters another distinct intermediate stage called a pupa or chrysalis. This is the resting stage, and in the life cycle of the Lepidoptera often lasts several months, during which a complete reorganization of the anatomy takes place inside the pupa. From the immobile pupa, there emerges the graceful adult, expanding its crumpled wings to dry and harden in the air. In this type of insect, then, there have been four distinct stages, egg, caterpillar, pupa, and adult. The same type of life cycle is characteristic of several other orders, including wasps, flies, and beetles. 
Butterflies and moths have long tongues for sucking nectar from flowers. The two pairs of wings are of different shapes and sizes, the hind wings being smaller than the forewings. The wing surfaces are covered with thousands of minute flat scales of different shapes and colors overlapping like the tiles on a roof. These scales give the order its name, for Lepidoptera means scaly winged. Another order, the Hymenoptera, are membrane winged, the wasps, the ants, and the bees. Once again, there are two pairs of wings, but in this order, the fore and hind wings are held together in flight by an arrangement of small hooks. The Hymenoptera are amongst the most highly developed of all the insects. Many live in large and efficiently organized colonies. The society of honey bees is highly complex, with its workers going about their varied tasks outside and inside the hive, its idle drones, its endlessly, monotonously busy queen. The ants, too, live in highly organized colonies, generally underground or under stones. Although they are Hymenoptera, the ants we normally see around, the worker ants, are wingless. The wasps also live socially in a more or less complex society, according to their species. A simple characteristic for the identification of insects of this order is that the abdomen is joined to the thorax by a very narrow waist. In this wasp-like insect, there is no waist, so this is not a wasp. It's a hover fly, belonging to the order Diptera, or two-winged flies. In the Diptera, there are no hind wings. The mouth parts may be built for sucking, as in the tongue of the house fly, or they may be hypodermic needles, as in the mosquito. Another blood sucker is the flea, which belongs to the order Siphonaptera. The fleas are highly developed insects whose ancestors once possessed wings, but which have lost them during the course of evolution owing to their parasitic habits. In the order Coleoptera, the name, which means sheath-winged, gives the clue to the chief characteristic of the beetles. The front wings are completely horny and are not used for flight at all. They are nothing more than cases for the protection of the delicate, much-folded hind wings. There are more species of beetles than of any other order of animals. Some quarter of a million are known. They vary in size from the microscopic to the largest of all insects, the goliath beetle, which may measure up to six inches long. we call insects are a vast array of similar yet dissimilar creatures whose world is intimately interwoven with our own. In the insect world, beauty and the beast live and grow and multiply in their various intricate ways. Many are harmful, 
Many are beneficial. Some merely annoy us. However, whether we like it or not, the six-legged army is here to stay, not only in our garden, but the whole world over. It was wise Aristotle who said long ago, we ought not to childishly neglect the study of even the most despised animals, for in all natural objects there lies something marvelous.